Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. It is not every day where we get to learn from a Super Bowl winning coach and his thoughtful collaborator. Today is that day. So thank you for joining us from all around the world to have this discussion about what the search for the next great NFL quarterback can teach us about data-driven decision-making. I'm Ben Shields. I'm a senior lecturer here at the MIT Sloan School. I'm joined by Coach Brian Billick, who is the author of The Q Factor and, as you may know, the former head coach of the Baltimore Ravens. I'm also joined by his co-author of The Q Factor, James Dale. A little bit about me and my work. One of my key research and teaching questions is how leaders and organizations can use data and analytics to make better decisions. That is a question that faces all different types of industries, no matter what your business problem. The way that I address that question is by studying sports. Sports is an industry with many high stakes decisions <clears throat> and an increasingly available data set to help inform those decisions. I also study sports because it's a lot of fun. And it's fun because we get to talk to experts, people who have devoted their entire lives to analyzing and making decisions about key sports related issues. And we have one of the best with us here today. As I mentioned, Coach Brian Billick is here, as well as James Dale. This is their new book, The Q Factor, The Elusive Search for the Next Great NFL Quarterback. Uh, coach Billick is a prolific author in addition to being a Super Bowl winning coach. He, among the books he's written, is Finding the Winning Edge with the great Bill Walsh. And also, Jim Dale is also a prolific author, too, writing a number of different books, including one with Cal Ripken Jr. So we've got some great experts with us today. And the conversation that we're going to have is very similar to the types of conversations that we have in our executive education program called Analytics Management Business Lessons from the Sports Data Revolution. So how are we going to cover the material today? Well, as I mentioned, we're going to dig into what Coach and Jim have found in their book. And to structure the conversation, we've got three parts to this webinar. For those of you that have worked with us at MIT, these parts to our teaching will be familiar to you. First, we're going to lay out a framework for the discussion. Second, we're going to look at some examples of the framework. And then finally, we're going to spend a little bit of time applying what Coach and Jim have learned to context outside of sports. Along the way, please feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A tab, and I'll be monitoring them. We'll be able to get to one or maybe two at the end of the webinar and also follow up with some answers afterwards. So without any further ado, I'd love to welcome in Coach and Jim. First of all, thank you both for taking the time to share your findings with us. Thank you for having us. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, let's start with the framework and some basic questions just so we can all understand what you did. What problem were you trying to solve in your work? How did you go about solving it? And then explain to us a little bit about what the Q factor is. You want me to start with that? Uh, the, the process was that uh, I guess I, like many people, was fascinated with the quarterback position as the most critical position in all of sports and symbolic of leadership uh, on and off the field. And I was fascinated with the idea, could we deconstruct this uh, process of finding that kind of talent and maybe get a little bit better at, at uh, predicting it? And um, I was working on this idea sort of mentally and I, uh, for quite some time, and I finally was put together with Coach Billick through a mutual friend. And we started to kick this idea around of, is there a Q factor? I don't know if it was named at that point, but to, to improve the ability to prognosticate success on the field. And when I first 
opened the got connected with the coach we started talking about this right away he said he was yes he was equally fascinated and as he said sometimes frustrated by that process and he said right away he said that the uh proposition of picking a quarterback is at best a 50 50 deal that for every man the manning there's a manzel to put it in pretty plain terms and there are plenty of of stars uh, who we miss in the first round, Kurt Warner, Dak Prescott, Tom Brady, who turn out to be great. So is there, could we find a better way? So we set out to do this and we use the 2018 quarterback draft class as our laboratory because it was a quarterback rich class. We said we can study, there are all kinds of quarterbacks in it and there are likely to be a lot taken in the first round. In fact, there were five, Baker Mayfield, Sam Darnold, Josh Allen, Josh Rosen, Lamar Jackson. And we could study them over two years in real time and see if we could draw any conclusions about not only what distinguished each of them, but also are there any clues to doing better in that prognostication in the future. And then we said to ourselves sort of, maybe if we come across some clues, maybe some of those are applicable off the football field as well. They might be applicable to finding leadership in other areas, notably in business and perhaps in other areas. That's how we got started. Yeah, and when Jim approached me, I've been approached by a number of people that a lot of people have always tried to apply Moneyball or analytics to, to football. And frankly, it just doesn't work. The Cleveland Browns most notably tried to put Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill in charge and it led to a one and 31 record over a two year period of time. So analytics in itself um, obviously has been a, a gradual growth into to the National Football League. But so when Jim approached me, my first instinct was, well, Jim, look, this is a 50 50 proposition. We're not going to money ball this. We're not going to find any special answer. But but uh, Jim's pretty persistent. And so we uh, we decided to tackle it. And I must say, I, I have learned a lot over the last two years. I think it's important for people to know we did this in real time. We looked at the quarterbacks involved prior to the 2018 draft because it was supposed to be a large draft. And there was a great diversity in the types of talents that were coming in. Uh, and, and so the analysis in the book in terms of, of uh their, their grades and what we thought of them was in real time. We didn't go back and now, you know, jury rig it due to history and hindsight. That's what was the actual, based on the people we've talked to, uh, my analysis of the players coming out. We then went through the draft and then we took the next two years because it really does take two years. Uh, Bill Walsh really felt like it wasn't until the 25th or 26th game that you could really tell whether a quarterback was going to be a guy or not. Now, it may happen earlier, but if it didn't happen by then, it wasn't going to happen. And, and basically, as we tracked through this to find what were the elements, what did we think going in, how did it turn out, and, and where can we improve that process is really what uh, the Q factor has been all about. That's great, Coach and Jim. And what's fascinating about your work is you're taking a decision that is so critical in football. You got to get the quarter pack position right. And you're asking the question, well, can we make that decision more effectively. And you took as your laboratory the NFL quarterback class of 2018. And for those of you that aren't familiar, here are the five quarterbacks that were taken in the first round. And then also here I have the pick and the team, the name, and then the college that each of the quarterbacks went to as well. So let's get into a little bit of a discussion, Coach and Jim, around what you found in your analysis. When I, when I look at these names, I see some quarterbacks really worked out quite a bit. <laughs> Others, maybe not so much. Talk us through your analysis and your findings when you went into this laboratory over two years. Coach, take that for a minute. Well, we, we, uh, in looking at it again, there, there's obviously has been a very distinct process. I go back to 1984, to me was the pivotal change in the National Football League. That was the first year that, A, the combine came into to being. It was initially in New Orleans, ends up being in, in, in Indianapolis ever since. That's where they bring the top 350 players in, into one space. It's very efficient with physicals, workouts, one-on-one -on -one interviews. Um, it used to be very scattered before that. That also happened to coincide when ESPN approached the NFL 
and Pete Rozelle and said, could we, could we televise uh, and could we broadcast the combine or broadcast the draft? And oddly enough, Pete Rozelle said, well, yeah, you can do it, but I don't know if anybody's going to watch it. And as we know, it has turned into this mega event in and of itself. So as Bill Polian said, that kind of, uh, he calls it the, the draft industrial complex. It brought together these circumstances that brought this huge lens into the analysis process and the drafting process from the combine to the draft in, in looking at these quarterbacks. Uh, in conjunction with, particularly as of late over the last 10, 15 years, where the analytics were beginning to work their way into clubs uh, and the use of computers to chart and see if they could find that right formula to put a baseline as to what we should be looking for uh, in, in a quarterback in the NFL draft uh, in varying success. And, and the interesting thing, as we chart both with our class and throughout the years, over the last 20, 25 years, at best, it's a 50-50 proposition. It was back in the 80s and 90s. It certainly is even today when you would think, I mean, when you look at it, in what world do you take Mitchell Trubisky in front of Patrick Mahomes and Deshaun Watson? In, in what analytics do you take Josh Rosen from UCLA with the 10th pick and let Lamar Jackson fall to 32? So even with the growth uh, in the resources and the use of analytics, we still have this pretty much 50-50 combination in terms of success ratio to failure. And what, uh, and what uh, uh, we might I add, yeah. I'm sorry, what, what uh, just coach Ed, what, what Bill Polian said about whether, if we could improve that slightly. Yeah, that 50, 50 is, is one that's been tried and true and Bill Polian who, and then we're doing a series of podcasts about the Q factor as well. Bill Polian has been brilliant. And as Bill said it very articulately, 500, batting 500 or going 500 in the NFL just gets you fired. He said, I just want to bat 525. Just let me be a little better. Let me be that one decision better. If I do that, now I'm in the playoffs, and if it's in the playoffs, I have a chance to be a Super Bowl team. So we're just looking for marginal or incremental improvement on a granular level because it can make a huge difference in terms of the success of your team, which clearly, and in, in choosing the right players, particularly in the quarterback position. So Coach and Jim, to that point about marginal improvement, how do you get that? I mean, how do decision makers, is it about acquiring better data? Is it about analyzing the data more effectively? Is it about figuring out what the intangibles are and better understanding those? How do you go from you know, batting 500 to 525? Give us your thoughts on that. Well, I'm gonna say that I, uh, in, in, in our collaboration over time, I latched onto a phrase that the coach uses, which is extrapolation. And I liked what it means literally and figuratively, you know, that you take what you know and you project from it. What it means also is you don't take things you don't know and project, which humans have a tendency to do. You know, you say, oh, well, you know, we saw this guy throw an amazing pass. Maybe he'll do that all the time, which is, would be, a, it's a fantasy. But extrapolations mean you, means that you take data, data in the sense that you look at, at what you've got and you look at what you know, and then you say, can I project out from this? Can I say, I mean, a simple, one of the simplest examples is completion uh, percentage. But if you see, if, and I learned this from, you know, I didn't, I didn't know this going in, but it's part of the education I got from Professor Billick, that if you see a guy whose completion percentage in college is flat, that's not such a good sign. If it's bumpy and it's going down now and then, it's a bad sign. It isn't likely to get better in the NFL with the best defensive players on earth. On the other hand, if it's going up, even a little bit, but steadily, you could say, well, maybe I've got something here. Now I can study that film and see if it's going up under the right circumstances, going up under pressure. So those extrapolations are what we tried to delve into to say, these are ways you could get a little a little bit of an, of an incremental edge. Yeah, I go back to, to Donald Rumsfeld's known knowns, known unknowns, and unknowns unknowns, okay? That last category, you gotta stay away from. You're just guessing. And you can do that in the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round, but you can't do that in the first round. 
Uh, the known knowns are great, but there's really not a lot of them. And so what we looked at and, and it was through a number of different matrix and analytics, but also from anecdotal, for lack of a better term, that, that gut reaction or your, your experiences where you look and say, look, I've seen this set of circumstances before and it either turned out or it didn't turn out. Because when you're looking at the quarterback or even in leadership position, uh, we talked to a, to a, a, in the podcast, I talked to some, then someone you know very well. Uh, she's the head of a global, uh, a, a global multi-billion dollar retailer and she's in charge of talent acquisition. And, and she called them non-negotiables meaning you have to set a, a floor of these are non-negotiables going in. The question becomes, how many of those am I going to negotiate when it actually comes to it? And, and, and you've learned in my profession, uh, need is a terrible negotiator and it's a worse evaluator. And so very rarely as a player, you look at the five players that we have, they all have certain non-negotiables, which are good, but there were some other things in there, and that's what made the class so interesting. They each had that little nick, whether it's Baker Mayfield and his maturity, a uh, lack of maturity, emotional, uh, Sam Darnold, who just uh, had all the boxes checked, but never really seemed to show up in the big game. Uh, Josh Allen, who had the completion percentage issue that typically is a death knell in the NFL. Uh, Josh Rosen, that had all the check marks, had all the mechanics but it was hard to really get excited about the young man personally in terms of leadership. And then Lamar Jackson, who everybody questioned, could that style of play last in the National Football League? And so it comes down to the three factors of, of the physical, the mental and emotional, and then the marriage within the system. All of them had the physical tools. Every bust in the National Football League of that 50-50 ratio I talk about. The worst busts in the NFL, whether it be Vince Young, Jamarcus Russell, Ryan Leaf, Achilles Smith, uh, uh, the list goes on and on. They all had the physical tools, but it was a combination of either the mental and emotional makeup that couldn't step to the next level, either in conjunction with or separately with they went to the wrong team at the wrong time. So going back and analyzing those, trying to marry those last two categories is really the challenge of the Q factor. That's, that's a fascinating observation about measuring and understanding the mental wherewithal of a potential franchise quarterback, as well as the system fit. I this do have right, to ask this question. Question. such a great job yeah. of dealing with it in the book, and I know it's on the people's minds. You know, when we look at the 2018 draft class, we see the 2019 NFL MVP taken as the last pick, number 32. So how do we learn from that so that teams – don't necessarily pass on a potential game-changing franchise quarterback in the future. Well, there are a couple of the, uh, I'm, go ahead, one, Jim. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. Uh, well, one of the extrapolations that we, we came away with was to not be slave to some of the old quote-unquote rules, knee-jerk rules, like, like a quarterback's too short and then you miss a Russell Wilson. Uh, or uh, or things like mobility. And, you know, it was a knock, and this goes to your question on, on Lamar. You know, the question was, he, he's a fantastic athlete. The question was, is he, is, is he going to make it in the NFL? Does he have all, those, all the tools? And then, if he runs a lot, there's always this, it's dangerous, dangerous to run a lot. One of the things we'd said is, we, we're not going to assume anything, and we dug into the data on that. We came across a guy named John Barrows who does a study on uh, on injury of pocket passers versus mobile quarterbacks. And guess what? There's a 0.02% difference in the injury rate. And of course, if you, you could call up the worst images you've ever had in your mind of, of seeing quarterbacks or any player get hurt. And, um, you know, this is, this is not a, a data defense, but they, a couple of major ones have been pocket quarterbacks. That doesn't mean it's dangerous to be a pocket quarterback. It means you can't use that rule to rule a guy in or out. Yeah, and the interesting thing with our class was Lamar Jackson's a perfect example. Most people projected him as a second round pick for the very reasons Jim has just articulated. <coughs> there were questions about could his style last in the NFL? Could he stay healthy? And what were his actual quarterback skills from within the pocket? 
which ultimately you, you can't win in the NFL with an athlete who can throw. It's got to be a quarterback that has a certain amount of athleticism. And there was questions whether Lamar Jackson was in that latter category. The key here is, and we gave you the three criteria, the physical, the mental, and emotional, and the marriage with the right team. Also keep in mind that when you take a quarterback in the early part of the draft, which typically you do, you, you do because you're there because you're probably not very good. When you take a quarterback with a 30-second pick, you're usually a pretty good football team, as were the Baltimore Ravens. They did a brilliant job of moving up prior to the second round, all but the last pick, and, and shortstopping people to take Lamar Jackson. Plus, they did not do it out of need. Remember we said need's a terrible evaluator, and it's even a worse negotiator. And because they had Joe Flacco, a former Super Bowl winning head uh, 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 quarterback, on campus, so to speak, and they were a good team, they could take a chance with a 30-second pick on Lamar Jackson because they weren't asking him to play right away. So again, our five examples give us a good cross-section of those that were that probably uh, misinterpreted some of the data because of need and dropped down some of their non-negotiables versus one that took a chance late in the draft, but only because there was less of a cost in doing so. This is this is great, and we're getting into some issues around decision making that I think relate to leaders in all different types of industries. And in our last few minutes here, before we get to a couple of questions, I'd be curious about, based on your findings in your book, what can decision makers in other industries learn about making more effective decisions? Yeah, I do a lot of, or did a lot of corporate speaking, of course, before COVID hit, um, and, uh, uh, and really enjoyed it because it took me out among the business people who, again, they would bring me in ostensibly to talk about leadership or goal setting or, or the, the very things that we're talking about as it applies to the NFL. Uh, and I found it, when I got around the companies, it was very interesting because the process is identical in terms of deciding first, what is the skill set we're looking for? What are those non-negotiables? When are we going to negotiate those non-negotiables? But again, alluding to the, the, uh, the individual that, that we, I sat and talked with for the podcast uh, that does talent acquisition on a global level, that we went through all the metrics and, and setting the filters and what the negotiables and non-negotiables were. But the final point, and she was very emphatic about this, that the biggest mistake made, and I find this all the time when I go and speak to companies, and we alluded to it, and Jim alluded to it earlier, is when you don't take into account the marriage between the culture that you're hiring into and the person that you're hiring. And this is typically, none of us want to be slaves to analytics and, and let just the numbers tell us that this this person will do well, and this doesn't. We want to have that anecdotal. We want to have that interaction. But this talent acquisition leader said that typically, though, when we go outside the analytics, uh, because we thought we saw something, or we got enamored with an individual, the biggest mistake, when that led to his mistake, was when we did that and didn't match it up with the culture, the culture of what we're doing. Now, the analytics can't describe the culture exclusively, and there certainly has to be anecdotal and, and actual for, again, a lack of a better term, uh, a, a gut instinct as to whether someone will fit or not. But the biggest mistakes, and whether it's on the football field or in the business world, is when you ignore the culture. I'll tell a quick story to underline it. Ryan Leaf and Pipe Peyton Manning in a famous draft. A lot of people won't admit to the fact that Ryan Leaf was rated as higher, higher than Peyton Manning by a lot of people. Now it's easy to look back and say, oh, no, no, I knew Ryan Leaf wasn't going to be very good. The fact of the matter is Bill Pullian, again, I give him great credit for admitting that when they did, and they had the number one pick, was that they really thought a lot of Ryan Leaf. And it was a tough decision that these players, that we used to say, were touching in their analysis. But as they worked them both out, and Jim tells a story, or Bill tells a story coming back from a workout of Peyton Manning with Jim Mora that the deciding factors when Bill looked to Jim Moore and said, Bill, uh, Jim, if, if we're going to stay true to our culture and everything we said we want to be about and everything we decided, Peyton Manning fits that to a T. The upside on Ryan Leaf may be better. He may have more physical skills, but Peyton Manning 
fits the culture we said we wanted to have, and that's what led to the decision, and that also obviously was the right decision. Right. Coach, Coach that's so helpful, and, and it's something that I know a lot of organizations struggle with as well outside of sports. You know, is it the, the talent or the culture? Yes, well, it's, it's an both. Idea. And, and your point drives both. that home nicely. Jim, anything else to add on this? It, it, it is both. And one of, one of the, um, you know, we, when we were digging into this, you know, the, we say it's 50-50 for a quarterback. And uh, statistics show, you know, executive failure is in the 75% rate. And something like, like in the last 10 years, two out of five CEOs failed in 18 months. Now, whether they really failed or whether people got impatient. But a lot of that is culture management. And one of the things that you'll see is sometimes is you'll see a very traditional Fortune 500 dividend-driven company go out and hire kind of a wild card CEO that doesn't often work. You'll sometimes see what used to be an exciting startup go hire a more traditional CEO often doesn't work. Venture capitalists are a pretty good um, instructive group in this that they say, the good ones, don't bet on a product, they bet on a person. Now you still have to evaluate that person and that's what we're talking about here. But again, we would say, I think that there are extrapolations you can uh, attach to executives just as you can to quarterback prospects. And I will share a few of my, my interactions with business and evolve to it, both from my coaching position and then, and then actually learn more about when I would interact with these clubs. It's very cliche. And you've probably heard them many before, but but I've evolved to it in a number of different ways, not the least of which having lived it, was that, and, and you've heard this before from some people like Simon Sinek, that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And I can tell you as a coach, as a leader, people don't follow you because of what you say, they follow you because of why you say it. And they don't care what you know until they know that you care. When you combine those three, it underlines exactly what Jim is talking about. Yes, the product is good. In my world, we have the cap, and it's an equalizer, and everybody has the same access to the same resources. So why are some teams better than others? Because it's not just the product. It's not just the better mousetrap. Because you can develop the better mousetrap, but in today's world, someone's going to steal it, make it their own, and make more money out of it, okay? It's not necessarily proprietary. Right but it's that concept of the people that you've got doing it that are going to be at the core of that success. And I can tell you that's true in the NFL as well as the businesses I've interacted with. Yeah. See the, the, the alignment between what we can learn from the NFL and how it's applicable to the business world, I think is quite clear. And to that point, we've got quite a few questions coming in. Let me ask a couple. And again, as I mentioned, we'll get to as many as we can, but in the end, we will also follow up with some answers as well. All right, I've got an interesting question here from uh, Hari, I believe. In the analysis for these five quarterbacks, did the data from other position players on those college teams impact the analysis on the QB performance? For example, a QB with a strong O-line could have better performance and vice versa. Yeah, one of the hardest things to do, whether it's in evaluating college talent or even in the NFL, is to separate the play of a quarterback from what's going on around him. The most typical example is you take uh, Baker Mayfield, came from an Oklahoma team, <laughs> unbelievably talented. So he's got great talent around him, receivers that get open more uh, compared to, to you look at to a, to a Josh Allen that came from a Wyoming that obviously is a step down, didn't have quite the same talent around him. In current parlances, how do we judge a, a Sam Darnold and his effectiveness when he's with a New York, New York Jet team that, quite frankly, isn't very good? Uh, so that's one of the difficulties in separating that analysis. You have to factor that in. Uh, and, and when I look at it, I, I don't worry as much about the environment that they're in. For instance, Josh Arnold, uh, Josh Allen, people can say, well, Wyoming wasn't as quite a good a team. Well, I still value what he was able to do because not, that, doesn't, that also means that his talent was commensurate with the talent he was facing. So there wasn't this drastic difference, okay, compared to Baker Mayfield. Yeah, he was at Oklahoma, but he's playing some pretty good teams as well. 
So from that standpoint, I, I don't think you have to judge it as much. From the emotional and mental standpoint, the biggest question is, okay, when the young man takes the jump from Laramie, Wyoming, into one of these major NFL cities, compared to Baker Mayfield, who was on the ultimate stage in Oklahoma, Sam Darnold at USC, uh, Josh Rosen at U, uh, UCLA, maybe Lamar Jackson less so at, at Louisville, but still he, he was a Heisman Trophy winner. Um, it's can they make the mental and emotional jump less so than the people around them and the physical talents, but it, are they going to make Ryan Leaf, perfect example versus uh, uh, Peyton Manning. Ryan Leaf clearly didn't have the emotional or mental cap capacity to go from Spokane uh, or, or uh, uh, Washington State University uh, on the Palouse, as they say, into the big stage. So that it more has to do with that emotional and mental evaluation as opposed to the physical and who they're surrounded with. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. I got another question here from Walter, and he says, how would you isolate slash mitigate need from the decision-making process? He says, realistically, there are situations with urgent needs, and following your line of thinking, that implies that there is a much higher risk of bad decision-making at those critical times. Yeah, I'd come back to my initial, uh, the known knowns, those are easy. Great player, it fits your need. Uh, the analytics check off, they check all the boxes. Those are easy decisions. Uh, again, as long as you're using the proper analytics and the right filters, there's no negotiating going on. The known unknowns, that, that becomes the difficult one because if you have some of your basic non-negotiables, but you look at specific talents that you, you counterbalance with anecdotal observation or some of the analytics that help you maybe explain some of the unknowns or why someone's not performing at a certain level, then you've got a chance. If need takes you into the unknown unknown, that we desperately need this core, that's how you end up with Josh Rosen at number 10. Uh, at number 10. Uh, to me, the year with it, Jake Locker and Christian Ponder and Blaine Gabbert all came out. These were should have been second round picks, but because of desperate need by the teams, they all came into the first 12. And I think it was eight, nine, and 12. Uh, perfect example of unknown unknowns that you, you, you basically threw out your, your non-negotiables altogether because you had such a need and figured, you know what, we're just going to take a shot. And, and, and none of them turned out. Uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, you can't roll the dice and, and maybe you hit it, you know, just right. But typically it does not. So as hard as it is, you have to ask yourself, how far, how many non-negotiables out of need am I willing to put up with? And, and if, you know, I, I'm very much a believer in blink of if your first instincts are, boy, I think I'm going to bridge too far, you probably are. That's, that's one of the best coach. Things Thank you so much for that answer. Jim, anything to add quickly? Yeah, one of, the, one of the best things you can do to resist need is to look at the history and say, if you if you react out of need, history is against you. You're, bet, you're betting your job, even though that pressure's on to win or to get that person right now. History is, you're gonna lose. Well said, Jim. And that brings us to the end of our conversation. We could continue talking about this for a long time, but we've got to stop it here. I will say, though, that if you are interested in learning again from Coach and Jim, as well as the broader group of experts that we bring to bear here at MIT, we have an opportunity for you. Analytics Management, Business Lessons from the Sports Data Revolution. It's a two-day program offered through MIT Sloan Executive Education. It starts next Thursday, October 22nd, and will last through Friday, October 23rd. So hope to see some, if not a lot of you there. Thanks again to Coach Billick. Thanks so much to Jim. And thanks to you all for sharing your time with us. Take good care. Thank you very much for having us.